I'm not sure I can think of something that I think would make a bigger impact quicker on the world than if more of us as Christian people could be more genuinely yep. generous. friends, and welcome back to the Pastor Talk Podcast today. Uh, I'm Michael Gawecki here with Clint Lovell. We're beginning a new series here on the channel where we are talking about faith resolutions. It's going to be a really pretty short series as far as our series go. We're just going to have three sessions here together, but we're going to be reflecting here in a moment as we're recording this. Uh, we're coming into a new year, 2023, and it's a moment in season of that cultural cycle where people are beginning to think again about new possibilities, about resolutions that they might want to make. Of course, you have those things that might be stereotypical, your uh, foods I'm going to eat or not eat, or exercise I'm going to do, or practices I'm going to weed out, you know, whatever that might be. It's a moment in which culturally we recognize the possibility of what might be new. And as we leaned into that, Clint and I have been having conversation about what does it look like to bring that moment and to reflect upon it from the perspective as faith people. And how might we come into this season with a new kind of openness to places in our faith that we might need to make some resolutions, where we might need to decide that some action needs to be put to help us add new practices in our lives, or maybe subtract some practices in our life. Maybe if we were honest, this could be a moment for us of redirection in a, a potential set of places. And so uh, today, coming to that, Clint, I think we want to invite that conversation, both between ourselves and those of you joining us here, to, you know, what are some things that might be worth resolving to commit to as we seek to grow in our faith together? Yeah, I think we find ourselves kind of this a week into the new year, Michael, piggybacking on the cultural conversation. The, the change of calendar is always that moment where a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people give some conscious thought to where they are and where they'd like to be in regard to practices or weight loss or health or some behavior that they'd like to instill or cut out of their life. And I, I think the idea is to maybe borrow some of that language and think about what are a couple of the things Christians might resolve to do better in the coming year? What what might you and I and others who are listening, who are trying to be faithful to Jesus, seek to incorporate in our life in some meaningful way that really would be a mark of our, our Christian discipleship, our Christian faith, and, and our Christian character? And obviously, that could be a big list. Right. I, we could put dozens of things yeah. on that list, but we've thought that for the next couple of weeks, three weeks, I think, we, we'll just highlight one thing at a time. And in some ways, maybe these are the, the broadest, I, I, um, in the sense, at least, I think, Michael, that they could apply to just about everyone. I think each of us could aspire in these three themes to do better. And, you know, which brings us maybe to point one, these are things to do. Um, you know, we, we were just talking before we turned on the recorder here. One of the interesting things about cultural resolutions is not only do most of them fail, we know they're going to fail. People laugh about them. We, we joke that Right. that the gyms are full, but they won't be in three weeks. You know, so spiritually, it's no different. Anything that we want to do that is worth doing is going to take some work. It, it, these things are going to right. demand of us some conscious thought, some reflection, and some effort. They're not the kind of things that we just say, oh, I want to do more of this. I want to be better at that. And they happen. Uh, the Christian life demands some consistent effort. And these kind of themes are no exception to that. You know, Clint, that's well said. And I would point out that I think that 
when we turn the chapter and we begin looking at this not from a perspective of personal health or personal betterment, but we look at this from the perspective of faith, I think what we discover is that there's actually a lot more at stake here than whether or not you're going to keep your gym membership. Because as people of faith, when we come to the question about resolving, what do we resolve to do in our practices of Christian discipleship, what we're asking is actually deeper than just behavior. And I want to be clear that there are behaviors that Christians should inculcate. We should learn and grow in our practices of prayer. Certainly, we should learn and grow in our practices of worship, of fellowship, of service. We should learn and grow in our practices of generosity, forgiveness. Some of these will be themes we're going to address in this series. But Clint, when we talk about the stuff that we do, it might lead us to believe that these are the things that are ultimately going to make us sort of farther down the road. They're going to carry us down the road of faith. When in reality, the perspective of faith practice is valuable, not in what uh, is defined as the action itself, but rather what it does to our character, who we become in the process of it. And today we're going to spend some time reflecting on generosity. And I think that's a good example of one of these resolutions. When we think about resolving to be generous people, we're not resolving to do that because it's a nice idea, or we're not resolving to be generous because it's going to help us at tax season with our contributions. Rather, we resolve to be generous because it has the power to fashion within us spirits of generosity, which reflect the divine and perfect generosity of a God who sent and gave his son in the perfect act of generosity. In other words, it's not just about the fact that we're doing something good, it's that that, that practice and that resolution leads us to become more and more like the one who is the perfect definition of what it means to be a full, complete, and perfect human. That in the resolution itself, we become more and more of a particular kind of person. And that is a fundamentally, I think, different way to view the resolution. It's not about adding bricks on top of each other, action upon action that make us good people with scare quotes, but rather it's as we behave and resolve in a particular behavior, that behavior opens a way or a path for us to become more like the one who we're called to reflect in our lives. Yeah, Michael, I, th I think of it as a matter of sort of integration. In other words, integrating or building those traits into our discipleship. So yes, generosity is a, is a good thing. But in this conversation, generosity is specifically a Christian thing. It is a mark of Christian discipleship to be open in spirit, to be open in giftedness, to be open in gifting others. It, it is a bent that is to be noticeable in the Christian life, in the Christian walk. And I, I think, as I think about it, Michael, one of the struggles that I see in the broader world around us in faith, in, in you know, it, it's maybe, it's not surprising. We've been through a difficult season. We've been through a divisive season. There are lots of differences of opinion and thoughts on just about everything. But I think one of the sadnesses in that is that it has been a season in which many Christians seem to regularly give evidence to a kind of smallness of spirit, a, mm. a lot of anger, a lot of accusation, a lot of bitterness. And it's not to say that those same Christians might not be very generous givers in some aspect of their life, but as you hear and witness them, generosity, an openness, a graciousness of spirit is not the affect. It, it's not what gets communicated. And, you know, I want to circle back to what we said, that, that this is hard. This is, it is work to change some of those patterns. But I, I think we see a regularly um, distressing example of ungraciousness or what we might call ingratitude in 
in in a lot of Christian circles. I, I don't think it's a thing that the church is doing particularly well right now, the, the broader church. I don't mean First Presbyterian. I'm, I mean Christianity in general. I, I think there's a sense in which generosity, if by that we mean more than the dollars we give, right, is a struggle right now for a lot of people of faith. And, and I think, you know, that occasions this conversation. Well, so Clint, that's one way to look at this conversation. One way to look at this conversation is a couple pastors sitting behind a desk, taking time to reflect on the importance of where we give our money. And that is important. Our sure. resources, our physical resources are important. Jesus makes it clear that you can't serve God and money at the same time. And one way that the church has built gu uh, guide rails or guardrails in our life is to say that we should actively reflect upon and measure where we invest our physical resources, because if you are attentive, you will discover that it is the propensity of the human heart to invest in things that both matter to us and that will become to matter more and more to us as time goes on. It is remarkable, actually, if you watch to see how what on its surface is just us, you know, going to uh, give money to a particular restaurant or us investing in a cause that matters to us. It's fascinating how quickly we go from people who are on the sideline to putting that thing at the center of our life. There's something substantial about what we use our money for and our resources towards and, and the way that that impacts our deeper values and character. So on one hand, yes, that's part of the conversation. On the other, though, let's take a moment and reflect upon the fact that this isn't about just financial giving. This isn't just about our resources. This is about how we operate in the world. And you use the word, I think, instrumental to, to this conversation. As we think about Christian generosity, we have to grapple with Christian openness, open-handedness. If the closed hand, if the fist is the symbol of anger, of fighting, of discord, of strife, I think the open hand is the Christian symbol of giving, of generosity, of the letting go. And that, I think, is what is so critical. Because when you restrict the conversation, Clint, to money, the letting go sounds like an appeal to we want your resources. But if you open the conversation to letting go of all of the things that clamor for our attention in our life, how we use our time, how we use our resources, where we invest uh, all of the things that we care about and the time that we have to care about those things, if we let some of those things go for the sake of another person, we begin to discover that generosity is not fundamentally a consumerist movement. It is fundamentally a question of who we're going to be. Are we people who are open to allow the things within our lives to be shared with others? Or are we the kind of people who will hoard and gather to ourselves? That is a question of character and identity, not fundamentally a question of what data you send to the IRS and tax season. And I think that is the conversation that people of faith need to have when we think about being generous people. Yeah, I've been fortunate to know many generous people in my life, Michael, as have you, and I think most of our listeners would be able to identify some. And the thing that I think we would all be able to say is that it is exceedingly rare, maybe in fact unheard of, that they would simply be generous in one area of their life. People who are generous with money are typically generous with praise. They're typically generous with patience. They're typically generous with time. It, it, it is not simply enough to say, oh, that person gives a lot in this area, and therefore they are generous. Generosity is bigger than that. When we talk about it from a faith perspective, when we talk about Christian generosity, we mean all of that. We mean a giving spirit. We mean a, a predisposition toward saying yes, toward open-handedness, toward graciousness. And w when we give someone something they deserve, right, that, that's not exactly right. general. When the server right. at the restaurant does a great job and we tip them generously, Yes, that's gracious 
to some extent, but it's not, it's not the full extent of what we mean when we say generosity. Generosity also applies and maybe particularly applies to those moments when you wouldn't have to give someone something, when they haven't deserved it, when you're kind to the person who you have every reason not to be kind to, when you're patient with the person who is on your last nerve, when you bite back the word that you could justifiably point at someone with anger, that those are the moments of, of Christian generosity as much as, hey, I, I gave a very nice donation to this, or I went and spent a day and volunteered here. Those are also wonderful things. But it's a bigger picture than I think we often uh we often start with. And so maybe the thing, Michael, would be to back up and say, where do we begin? In other words, the first question we encounter, why do we give? Why is it that Christians should aspire to this idea of generosity, this broad Mm -hmm. definition of what it means to be open-handed and giving people? Why is that matter in the first place? So I'm going to turn to Scripture to make a case for that. I I think that we see in many moments in Scripture, like the Old Testament as an example, the practices of almsgiving is required, it's expected of the people of Israel. We have been going through the book of Exodus together, and practices such as leaving a field open and allowing uh, at some definite period of time for those who are poor to be able to go glean from it is a practice of generosity. These are ways I think we see sort of that built into the expectation for the covenant people of God. But I want to be more specific than that. Uh, turn here to the book of Second Corinthians and to set that up, you got to note that uh, Paul has a, a strange task as an apostle. I mean, Clint, he's working with a, a variety of of people. He's working with Gentiles far outside Jerusalem. And in the second book of Corinthians, we see him collecting an offering to send to the church in Jerusalem. And that is strange because of the geography of it, collecting money from a wide variety and then sending it over to a place. But it's also strange because of the racial makeup of that. You have Gentiles collecting money for the sake of Jews, a a, a different uh, sort of concentration of the church in a different place. And here we see uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 1, that it's connected directly in verse 1 to the grace of God. The grace of God has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. Uh, We move down here to verse 2. Their abundant joy, extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. It's connecting those two things I want to make the case for here, Clint, that it starts with the grace of God. Because of the grace of God given to us, because we've received that grace, it will therefore inculcate within us, like a seed that has been planted, if it's been planted, if it's been watered, if it receives sunlight and it has the proper nutrients and conditions, it will grow. If we have received the grace of God and the Spirit of God is alive and at work in our hearts, then we will become generous people. How could we not? How could we not live on the receiving side of the creator of the universe and not in some fundamental character way be impacted by it? Generosity and open-handedness, I would argue, Clint, is a necessary byproduct of this thing that we believe has been extended to us in Jesus Christ, and that is free gift. That, that's how we come to understand the word grace. It's this thing given to us we didn't earn or deserve. And so therefore, really, I want to make a very challenging case here. I don't think that this is a thing that we get to resolve to do if we like. I don't think that generosity is a thing of convenience. It is a thing that happens in those who have received God's gracious gift. And that is, I think, maybe the challenging aspect of this resolution language here, Clint, because we like to think that we get to resolve. I'm not sure that that's entirely accurate as it applies to generosity. We do resolve to put our best effort into it, certainly. We we resolve to allow the Spirit to work within us, but how could we be people who receive the grace of God in Jesus Christ and not be people growing in generosity? Right. All of our Christian practices are rooted in and come from the practice of Christ. So uh, all of our giving 
is a reflection of having first received. God has been good to us. God has shown us love when we showed God selfishness and sin and pride. God has shown us grace when we didn't deserve it. And it is going back to that reality. It is returning to that starting point over and over again. It is battling our pride. It is battling our selfishness. It is realizing over and over that God has given to us first when we didn't earn and didn't deserve. And that creates in us a a willingness, an openness, a desire to mimic that, to mirror the work of Christ for others. And it's it's never done. If we give 10%, which is, you know, the historic idea of tithe, that doesn't mean we shouldn't then have to be generous in other areas of our life. If we have almost no money and we don't have to give money, it doesn't mean we don't have to be generous. The generosity is bigger. The church has so often talked about stewardship only in regard to finances. And we have to move past that. We have to get to this bigger idea that in following Christ, our goal is not simply to support Christian causes and churches financially, but to be Christians who live outwardly with our time, our talent, our treasure, who hold everything that God has given us with loose hands, ready and willing to share them and invest them in the lives of others. Uh, That is bigger, I think more challenging, but most importantly, I think it is a more faithful idea of the goal of our our discipleship. You know, Clint, I anticipate there might be somebody joining us for this conversation thinking to themselves, okay, I get that. Sure. Uh, the idea of grace has come to me. I should be a person who practices generosity. Nice idea. And if that's you, uh, I think that's a fair point. I think we, this conversation leads us down the road, but it doesn't bring us to a destination. And I think that we have to at some point admit that we must begin taking steps of openness, of gratitude, of giving, of generosity, if we're going to continue to grow in the gift of it. And so I think it's worth spending a little bit of time not providing an exhaustive dictionary uh, by any means of what generosity and practices of generosity might look like in our life. But I do think putting some concrete ideas out there about ways that we can be more open in our lives, the way that we can practice generosity, I think can be helpful. I, you know, I'll start us off there. I, I think that we do often think of generosity so much through a, a financial lens that a thing like you've already mentioned, Clint, of you know, going to the restaurant and leaving a generous tip, the idea that I'm going to leave a lot of money on the table, may mislead us from a a far more practical Christian practice of being generous with the person who served. Uh, You know, I've been in moments where I've spoken with a variety of people who serve in restaurants, whether they be kids or adults, and I've heard about how some of the times, and this is a challenging thought, some of the most difficult times in their experience to serve we're immediately following church gatherings, whether that be church conferences or mm-hmm. Sunday services. And as a pastor, that's pretty convicting. The thought that folks are leaving our sanctuaries, going to places of fellowship, sitting around table, where their immediate response to the gracious proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ is inflexibility with the waiter, is being harsh, is using difficult language, is walking away, in some cases even, not leaving a generous financial tip. And I don't mean to be critical. I don't don't mean to bring a harsh lens to that, Clint. But if we believe that generosity is all about money, we're going to fail to see that we failed to be generous with another human being in that encounter when we're called as Christians to be generous in that moment, in that interaction. Yeah. uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of danger in tying the concept of Christian generosity to only our billfold, to only our wallet. Um, You know, one could back up and ask, 
as we made our way to the restaurant, have we ever thought about how many times do I need to go to her? What would it look like to sacrifice one mm-hmm. of those trips a week or a month and invest it somewhere else to give it to someone, to right. give it to an organization? What would it what would it look like to be conscious of the, the sort of general pattern? But you, to your point, Michael, um, yes, if, if we think that leaving – Ten dollars on the table means that how I acted while I was there doesn't matter. I, I, of course, we've gotten it wrong. Of, of course, we've been short-sighted. You know, in the same way that um, I, I used to serve a church that had a long-term practice of if you made a financial contribution you stayed on the rolls of the church. I, I think for generations that was not unusual, the idea that you you could yeah. sort of maintain a place on the active role of the church by making a financial contribution. Well, certainly those churches are grateful for those financial converse, contributions, but let's not, I, I mean, let's be honest, those people aren't active members. Or giving right. a, giving a check once a year does not make you an active member of a church in any real sense, whether they keep you on the rolls or not. That that's that's simply not the same. And so, yeah, how how can we move toward a generosity that is bigger than one specific expression of it? And if we start financially, since that's the most common place, it means intentionality. It means looking at our finances, saying, what could I shift? What could I do that would allow me to be more generous? Is there, a, is, there a, uh, is there an organization? Is there a cause that gets my attention in this season? Is there something that God might be showing me that I could invest in and maybe make a difference? Are there people I know who are trying but just aren't catching up? They're, they're sort of falling behind the curve. And is there a way that I could invest in helping them? I mean, I, I think opportunities to be generous are not in short supply. We can find them anywhere. And part of that means being knowledgeable of our own ability. Part of it, I think, means to... Uh, be intentional, to be cautious, to be, you know, a- again, growth takes some work. And if we are going to think, if if in hearing this conversation, one of the convictions you might be f- hearing is, I, I feel like I could be financially more generous, then take a path that would help you get there. Look at where your money is going. Look at where you'd like it to be going and build a bridge between those two things for some amount of it. And, you know, there there are lots of ways you could get there. The main thing is that you would want to and that you would be intentional about making some of those steps. I don't think that this is going to be too surprising, Clint, but and correct me if I if you disagree with this, but my experience has been that the Christmas season, uh, in culture, of course, but also in the church, is a season of extravagant generosity. Uh, folks will be coming in, and they'll donate an entire meal that could go to a needy family, or they'll go collect uh, families that they can buy Christmas presents for. There's There's a lot of expressions of giving throughout the month of December, to be quite honest with you. What's striking about this conversation is it's not happening in December. It's happening in January, and you're not going to be surprised to learn that need hasn't disappeared in the course of the last couple weeks, that there are families who desperately need help. Uh, families who are trying really, really hard. And, you know, sometimes we feel like we can't be generous. Not that we can't be generous. We struggle to find generosity because we don't know where to turn. I don't know what organization to help. I don't know where to find those families. I don't run across them every day. Yeah, and if that's the case, call the church. Our contact information is easily findable. The website uh, is fpcspirlake.org. Let you know we can direct you to places in our own local community that do that work really, really well. There's really no excuse for not being able to invest in people who are working and doing the very best that they can with the resources that they've been given. But the point is, 
that we shouldn't time lock the idea of generosity to a particular season. In fact, there may be no better season in the moment of resolutions, people thinking about things like health. Maybe it's time to knock out that coffee run every day. Maybe you don't need that $6 cup. And maybe that $6 you can give daily to a cause that matters. And you can do that for 12 months. If that's the the only uh, concrete step that you take, that is a practice of reorienting your life so it goes away from your own benefit to the benefit of someone else. That, that's the fundamental sort of muscle of generosity is inverting our lives away from the things that benefit us to seeking to benefit others. Because once again, we we'll to connect that to the higher value. That's what happens when people have received grace. It has to happen. You receive this gift that you did not uh, deserve or even understand. Now we are compelled by our faith and the receiving of that gift to find new ways to do that for the sake of others. Yeah, well, the true gift of generosity, Michael, is not just for those who receive it, but that for those who give it, it takes the focus off of self. When, When I am generous, when I am consciously and purposefully generous with time, talent, treasure, with talk. I I take myself out of the center and I put the attention and focus on someone else. I give to someone else. I support, I encourage someone else. And the, the, the gift in that for me as the giver is that I get to push back against my natural human instinct to put myself first all the time. And you know, that that's a wonderful practice. That becomes a spiritual practice. I think, you know, Paul comfortably talks about spirituality, um, generosity as a spiritual practice. And I, I think we can live into that. So we've talked a little bit about finances. I think maybe as challenging as that can be, I think a more difficult one would be our language, Michael. I, you know, I think yeah. we find ourselves most of us if we're if we're being honest significantly convicted when we get to the idea of being generous with our words and I don't mean talking a lot <laughs> I mean I mean saying things well saying positive things saying encouraging things and building the discipline not to add to the noise and negativity that is so prevalent and so easy to join. I, I think to be generous with one's voice, with with one's words, is a particularly in our current season, a monumental challenge. So there used to be in popular Christian culture, these bracelets that said WWJD, and that stood for what would Jesus do? Mm. I've always thought that a very helpful bracelet would be WWJS, what would Jesus say? Or maybe what wouldn't Jesus (laughs) say? Yeah, well, and that's that's where I was going to actually go, Clint, is because uh, there's a practice I've heard of that uh, I have not done myself personally, but has resonated with me, is the idea of getting some kind of thing, and it, it really doesn't matter, that you put on your wrist. And every time you catch yourself saying something that's not generous, you shift the thing from one wrist to the other. And, you know, it's a little bit of a simple practice, but the idea is awareness, being aware and and looking for, wait, did I just say something that was dark, something that was unnecessarily destructive, something that was not rooted in a generous spirit towards another, but rather maybe in my own brokenness? If that's the case, then that becomes a practice for you of measuring your words, of being careful about what you say. I, there is inherent value. And whether you do that with a thing on your wrist or at the end of the day, you just simply take an account, a short journal of what was the fruit of my language today? Looking back at your conversations, did I give in to fill in the blank? However you do it, generous speech is unbelievably challenging in a moment in which speech to us culturally feels free. That I get to say whatever I want to say and as much of it as I want to say, right? I mean, any person with access to the internet device can can go and say words all day long. 
Yet, that is not, by definition, measured, thoughtful, generous speech. Just because there's a large quantity does not mean that it came from a centered Christ-like heart. And I do think that there is substantial Christian tradition around reframing our words. And, you know, this is not in vogue today, but the historic practice of the church learning to speak in wholesome, open, generous ways has been to pray and speak the Psalms. I mean, it's literally been to turn to words of Scripture and to make that the fruit of our spirit and our soul. So, you know, maybe that is your practice of generosity, is to bring the Scripture inside your life and your heart in a new, consistent, resolved way so that that might flow out of you into the coming year. There are many ways to frame that spiritual practice. I think The matter is to identify what resonates, where the Spirit might lead you, and then commit to do. This is an interesting one, Michael, because part of what it means to be generous with words will often lead us to not say something, to not join in criticism, to be the place where gossip ends, to not pass along the juicy tidbit, to, to refuse the opportunity to say something negative or to talk about someone behind their back or to pass on that that thing that you heard that part of generosity in regard to our language is not only what we say and how we say it but what we don't say what we refuse to say and and if you've ever if if you've ever had the experience of trying to complain to a gracious person, to a, a generous speaking person. It's maddening because you, <laughs> it so, you so desperately want them to join you on the dark <laughs> side and they, and they won't do it. You know, oh, that person. And they say, well, yeah, that person's no. had a hard life. Yeah, but they, did you know that they did? Well, no, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I know that they've done some really good things. You know, and, they, and you just so much want to grab just them. Just complain with me. Bring them over. <laughs> and, and they... They refuse. They have built a kind of shield yeah. that protects them from that. And I, I aspire to that. I'm, I'm motivated by that. I'm moved by that. I'm not always very good at it, but I, I find it, um, I find it terribly, um, sometimes maddeningly, encouraging and inspiring to, to, to interact with Christians who have built that kind of discipline and that kind of generosity into how they do and don't speak. And I think there's a great lesson in that for the rest of us. I agree completely. I think one of the dangers of talking about generosity is that we choose the forms of generosity that are comfortable for us. You know, say like, I'd love to give more money to a cause and that just so happens to get published in the newspaper. I'd love to be, you know, more generous with my words so that people are happy with me or whatever it might be. I've got another moment or place where generosity might work on us as Christians. I'm going to admit to you, I think for most of us, it's a pretty challenging place. We could practice in the coming year being generous and patient people. Mm. It is very hard I don't like to be generous story. with patience. And the reality is that it, we live in a quick culture. We live in fast moving times. We all know that. We don't need to talk about it. But one of the Christian practices of having a large amount of flexibility and openness and ability to hold other people's difficulty and their brokenness and their struggles. Quite frankly, a a patience with others includes empathy, the ability to say, yeah, I don't know why they did that or said that. I don't know why this person radically different from me is saying these things, but yet, you know, Jesus has been patient with me. I need to be patient with others. I need to be slow to speak in the circumstance that I need to be willing to slow down and to let a thing play out before I make judgments or I say the thing if we were people who walked into the season and said, you know, I should have the kind of quantity of patience in my spirit that I can be generous with it with others, well, that's going to take more than a year uh, to resolve to do, Clint. Yeah, patience at some level, Michael, is a willingness not to have things my own way or at least a willingness to wait for things 
possibly be the way that I want them to be. And, and it again is, is a, it is a discipline of moving self out of the center and allowing the grace of Christ to be in the middle of who we are trying to and aspiring to be. And it is exceedingly difficult for many of us. There, there are those wonderfully blessed people who are right. almost by nature patient. They're, they're gracious. Now, I, I don't want to say that that's genetic because that undervalues the work that it took and the experience it took for them to get there. But there are people, I think, for whom patience is a kind of natural yeah. language. It, it's a home base in a way, either through training or through n- nature. Um, for the rest of us, it, it's like trying to wrestle a greased pig <laughs> on a boat in the middle of a hurricane. <laughs> and, and we so often get ahead of ourselves. We so often get ahead of others. We live at about 90% frustrated and just can can snap over and easily um, on, the, on the littlest things. And so um, how is it that we can become more generous with our patients? How is it that we can be more accepting of people and our differences and our opinions and their mistakes, more tolerant of uh, um, the ways in which we bump into each other? I, I think, you know, that is, that is a monumental challenge for Christians, and, and we often fail at it. Um, when we fail, unfortunately, it usually hurts our witness. When Christians right. snap, when Christians become publicly impatient, when, when Christians attack other people or other Christians, it never helps us communicate the grace of Jesus Christ. And, and so there is, I think, a, a huge challenge for us to spend some time and thought and prayer as to how might I let the grace of Christ lengthen my fuse and temper my impatience in a way that has a real affect, not only for me internally, but then because it affects me internally, it affects other people as well. And you know what's different as we try to practice being people who are generous with our patients, but other people, Clint, what's different is you don't really need to resolve to give your money differently or to do something differently because the reality of patience is we are each by definition of life given opportunities to practice patience every single day. You don't need to go looking for those moments. They will come naturally. The question as it comes to resolving to become people who are generous in our patience and capacity to be open with other people through difficult, long-suffering type circumstances is not that we need to seek out those situations. It's that we need to be mindful and to see the situations that naturally come into our life and to recognize them as opportunities to practice that muscle and to grow in that capacity. And I think that is one of the reasons why patience is such a struggle is because we don't get to set the terms of engagement. We don't get to define when we practice it. By definition, we're practicing it in some of the most difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, maybe, Clint, this is the point of the conversation where I confess, I think that as we come to talk about resolutions from the perspective of faith, we need to make it clear that this isn't just a conversation of willpower. It's not just a conversation about you doing better today and tomorrow and the day after. No, this is a conversation about you having a moment of prayer and thoughtful reflection and say, God, I know I need your help today. I know that I need your eyes to see this circumstance as an opportunity and not as a struggle. I know that I need the power of your spirit working within me, transforming me 
even saving me this day from my worst instinct to become a person with enough goodness that it flows over. It can be generous with those that surround me. This is where the conversation, I think, you know, coming somewhat to resolution, we find that this has never been about, can I just give more stuff out? It's, can I become the kind of person who is overflowing, cup runneth over, is the scriptural language, that I cannot contain the goodness so that it is generous with others. That is who Jesus Christ is. Goodness incarnate so that there is nothing but overflowing to the world around. And that is what a Christian who is overflowing with the grace of Jesus Christ will look like in the world. And however you seek to practice that muscle um, in this day or the coming days, you, you know, fundamentally, it's not practicing the doing, it's practicing the becoming. And I think that's essential. That's an essential difference. Yeah. And, cer- and certainly that's not something, Michael, that we can do on our own. It's also not something that we can do all at once. J- just as the person who resolves to lose weight has to start by attending to one meal eating a little less on one day. The person who needs to get in shape needs to get up and go for a walk the first day. You know, there is growth that will happen. And so that that may look like, Lord, this certain person drives me insane, but today I'm not going to complain about that. I may still feel some of that frustration. I may still want to let it out. But today, my goal is that that negative word is not going to escape my lip, not to them, not to anyone else, not even to no one else. I'm not going to say that today. That's going to be my first tiny step toward getting a rein on my tongue and becoming a more generous person with my words. Maybe it's, I, I'm going to You mentioned the coffee, Michael. On one day a week, I'm going to skip the coffee run, and I'm going to drop that off at Upper Des Moines or Discovery House or wherever it is where you live that might be doing good work. And and that's, that's where I'm going to start. Don't think that you have to get from where we are to saint in one. It doesn't happen. It can't happen. What can happen is that we allow Jesus to guide our steps one small halting step at a time so that hopefully we begin to make progress in this area. And and I think if we could do that, I I don't know, Michael, of as I consider Christianity as a whole, and if we want to talk about Christians, the church, we could say, I'm not sure I can think of something that I think would make a bigger impact quicker on the world than if more of us as Christian people could be more genuinely yeah. generous. I, I think the affect that could have on our communities, our congregations, our homes, our businesses, our work environments, I, I think if Christians could do more of this, and, and there are, there's lots of work for Christians to do, but I think this is one that can move the needle substantially and and actually fairly quickly and i think it could um validate our witness to a great extent if people heard from us and saw in us the grace of christ through our through our givingness our open-handedness more often i don't know if that makes sense but i i I think so i think though clint what's interesting about that is it's not a weird, subverted, evangelistic tool. You, you don't right. fake generosity and therefore, you know, trick people in. But I do want to say, and maybe you disagree with this, you know, there are going to be times when you don't feel generous. And maybe the goal in that circumstance is fake it till you make it. I mean, if that's all you've got today is to fake generosity, then fake it. I mean, be generous. Or be, be silent. Right. I mean, or do nothing. At, at the end Stay of... Stay here instead of going down the hill. Right. At the end of the day, it is God's work in our life that will transform the heart. We don't do that. And what we do is we wake up and we invite God by the power of the Spirit to work 
through our hands and feet. And so however you find today the opportunity to practice generosity, my hope for you is you'll see it, number one, that it, you'll see it as an opportunity because that's the first hurdle. If we make it our way through a whole day and we never see the opportunities for generosity before us, we never get to choose to do it. So I hope for you that you will, you will find ways and practices to see the moments where generosity is open and possible for you. And then my hope is that all of us will make the choice that we will invite the Spirit to work through us, that even if that is in the small way of biting our tongue to not say the word out of generosity, to practice patience with a spouse, with a child, with a coworker, with a troubled family member, whatever the case might, might be, if we could practice being generous with that person, if we can give today something that we own or something that we possess for the sake of someone else's betterment, whatever it will look like, if we can resolve and then do these practices of being generous, I think you're exactly right, Clint. What will be accomplished is both a growing sense of our identity as children of grace, but also and substantially a confirmation of our witness that we are, we are people who have, who have received grace, and that then can point others to the source of that grace, which is incredible that a gift can both uh, remake our hearts for good and it can invite another person to receive that same gift for themselves. It's literally uh, everyone can have their cake and eat it too. It is one of those few things where it's good upon good, but it does demand the work of resolving and doing and opening ourselves to that process. Absolutely. And if you've been listening to this and you feel uh, challenged, you feel convicted in some area that that there are opportunities in your own life to increase and practice this idea of Christian generosity, um, then we would encourage you to begin doing some of the work, begin doing some of the reflecting, some of the planning, some of the praying. Look for some concrete ways to express this kind of this kind of uh, intangible thing, this spirit of having received, so wanting to give. And um, I, I w write it down if you need to. Uh, if you have questions that come out of this conversation, by all means, reach out to us, let us know, send us an email, whatever that looks like. Uh, we'd love to continue the conversation. Glad that you're a part of this one. Hope that you can join us as we move on to another challenging uh, topic next week. Thanks so much for spending time. We'll see you next week.